<laughs> Greetings and salutations. Now I'm still working on gutting out the bus, but I came across something here that I wanted to talk about in just a short video on uh, basic construction techniques and, and some of the materials and some of the problems that you'll, you'll face um, if you hire somebody that doesn't know what the hell they're doing. So let me share with you some of uh, the, the insight that I gained from 30 years in the construction business and three of those years as an estimator for a uh, installation contractor. Now, this is a bus, this is in the house, but the same principles apply. You're trying to insulate to keep the cold out of a warm area. Actually, you're trying to keep the heat in to keep it from escaping because that's the direction that that's going to occur. It's always warm to cold. And what I have here is a cavity that I opened up here next to the emergency exit. And you can see that the insulation doesn't fill the cavity. And so the effective R value of this part of the cavity isn't the R6 or whatever the R value of this is. I'm guessing uh, with a 4 inch wall, 3.5 inches would be R13, R6, 6, 7, something like that for a 2 inch insulation. Um, then you've got a 2 inch gap here that's uninsulated, so the effective R value of this cavity is zero because there's convective occurrence that can occur here. Air can get through the gaps and, and escape out the, out the exterior. And more importantly, the, the uh, dew point temperature is going to be reached some, somewhere in here. If this space is heated and the outside is cold, the dew point temperature is going to occur inside this cavity. Moisture is going to condense on a surface that reaches the dew point temperature and this insulation is going to gather up some of that and hold it and find evidence of that all the way through these cavities there's you know rust spots and stuff so <coughs> when I saw this I thought of uh, back in the late 90s steel stud construction was a hot ticket item it was something that was new and people were starting to build with that in fact we've in, we insulated a few basements that were framed with steel studs be interesting to go back and see uh, how those have, you know, stood the test of time. But steel stud construction presents its own set of issues that need to be addressed. Now this would be an example of a steel stud constructed building. You need to understand that steel studs conduct the cold 300 times faster than wood. Wood itself has uh, a sort of R value into it and because it's wood and it's you know, you can put fasteners into it like stables and nails you can fasten mechanically fasten the bats the bat insulation to those studs you can't do that with with steel studs they either need to be taped or they just friction fit them and, and hope for the best but because that conducts heat so quickly and so effectively uh, what can happen especially in colder climates when you have a huge temperature differential is that you can actually have frost occurring on the surface of the drywall in a home but in this case of frost spots would would occur on every one of these bows and every one of these uh, these structural members you'd, you'd find condensation or frost if it was a big enough temperature differential you understand first of all how har value is uh, determined in the testing procedures that uh, that lend our value to a uh, material. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, probably the late 50s, early 60s, the industry was starting to standardize. You started getting into dimensional lumbers and uh, the government really wanted the performance of insulation materials to be standardized. So they needed a, a, uh, a standard of measurement for the performance of insulation. And the government went to Orange Corning to to make that determination. Interestingly enough, the, the primary uh, manufacturer of fiberglass insulation and fiberglass products. So Owens Corning came up with a testing procedure to determine R value. What is R value? R value is a material's ability to resist heat flow. So Owens Corning came up with this test. Basically what the test consists of is a test chamber that is 16 inches wide 16 inches tall, 16 inches because that's the nominal distance between studs and a home, and whatever the thickness of the material being tested would be. 
in this case, if they were testing this fiberglass material, the test chamber would be two inches thick. 16 inches by 16 inches, two inches thick. The material would be placed in this test chamber, sealed up, hermetically sealed so air couldn't get in or get out. And that test, well, actually, the material would be placed in, the, te the test chamber would be left open for 24 hours to normalize. And then 24 hours later, the test chamber would be sealed up hermetically so air couldn't get in or out. And then the test chamber would be heated on one side to 75 degrees, and the cold side would be maintained at 60 degrees, and a time measurement would be made to when the cold side reached normalization. At that point, a form, there's a formula that they come up with to figure out whatever the, the material's R value is. The point I'm trying to make is it's a 15 degree temperature difference between 60 and 75 degrees in a hermetically sealed test chamber without consideration to air infiltration or exfiltration, moisture content, and convective currents within that wall cavity. When you stretch that wall cavity out to 8, 9, 10, 12 feet, convective currents inside that wall cavity, because that's a porous material, air currents occur naturally within that cavity. Because warm air rises, it raises up, forces the cold air down, and that cycle repeats itself. If there isn't an adequate vapor barrier placed in the warm and winter side, moisture can be forced through the drywall into that cavity and wherever the dew point temperature is reached. And that's easy enough to figure it out. If you just go on Google and, and type in um, isometric chart, uh, you can find an isometric chart that can help you determine where the dew point temperature will be at, at a certain temperature between uh, you know, determining what the temperature difference is between the inside and the outside in relative humidity, you can accurately predict where the dew point temperature can be reached. Usually that's within the wall cavity, and that moisture is deposited on that uh, surface of material at the dew point temperature, usually within the, the confines of that insulation, and that moisture uh, absorbs into the material, further degrading the performance of that material. And then anytime there's a penetration into the wall cavity from the inside, or penetration from the outside, there's generally areas where air can get in and increase that uh, convective current, especially like around electrical outlets, wire chases going into a cold attic, you're forcing through the stack effect, you're forcing warm air into your attic. I've gone into attics that were within five degrees in the winter time, five degrees of uh, the indoor air temperature because of all the can lights and, and wire chases, plumbing chases that weren't sealed up during the construction process. A great way to eliminate all those issues is to use a product like a spray applied uh, iso, isosanurate or a polyurethane foam closed cell insulation. That's one of the products that I was uh, selling back in the 90s. But that, that stuff is sprayed in to a surface as a liquid and it seals everything off and because it skins over and it has a, um, it's impervious to water infiltration. It provides its own vapor barrier, and it performs. A great example is your refrigerator. Look how thin your refrigerator is. Your refrigerator is insulated with polyurethane insulation, not fiberglass. But they were back in the 50s, and they were this thick, right? So, if you're building a house, you need to take these things in consideration. Just because you have a product that says it's going to perform at R whatever. Let's, let's use a four inch wall for an example. Just because it says R13 and you're putting that into the wall, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get R13 performance out of that wall system. Because all those materials are gonna, you know, you got plywood that's, that has an R value, drywall has an R value, all those components combined, you, you may have an R13 insulation, but the total R value of that wall system might be R15. But that's gonna be degraded by the the penetrations in the wall system, air infiltration, exfiltration, moisture, condensation within the wall system, convective currents, and if you're using uh, non-traditional building materials like steel studs, you need to consider the, the thermal loss and how it's going to compromise the overall thermal performance of that wall system based on the conductivity of steel being 300 times greater than wood. If you're going to use steel studs, there's advantages to using steel and there's disadvantages to using steel. Probably that is the biggest disadvantage, is that uh, this is a great conductor. And what you would want to do 
based on the research that I did back in the 90s, what you want to do is hang as much uh, foam insulation, foam board type insulation on the outside that you possibly can and to use as few fasteners as possible because of those metal fasteners are also conductors. So it's just some food for thought. I just kind of throw out some just, bleh, you know, building science for you. And uh, the way I'm going to do, I think the way I'm going to do the insulation here is rather than hiring a contractor to come in and spray this stuff, I'll probably just buy a couple of kits. Um, probably about a thousand dollars to do this bus the way I want to. I might do the, the flat areas in foam, but the curved areas in the hard to reach areas with uh, the spray foam. You know, a couple of things that my sister's building a house right now. My sister and my brother in law are building a house in Chicago. And she posted a picture of it on Facebook, and the Tyvek is isn't running. You know, they it looks like a bunch of hacks are building her house. Um, sorry, Denise, if you find this video, and I don't mean to um, criticize your judgment, but it sometimes it pays to know uh, how those materials are supposed to be put on, like Tyvek, for example, how it's supposed to be put on, and then you go out and you see some. Uh, examples of what people do and they run it vertically it's not supposed to be run vertically it's supposed to be run so you can read the Tyvek on it and all the tape all the joints are supposed to be taped and it's supposed to be overlapped at least six inches and I mean and they're not doing that in her house and and I know she's paying a pretty uh, good penny to have a house built in the suburbs in Chicago and I saw that and I, that's not good so that's kind of what pre precipitated this video uh, um, I hope it was informative. If it wasn't, I'm sorry to waste your time. And uh, stick around. I'm going to have this uh, bus cleaned out in the uh, next video. I'll show you what, uh, what this bus looks like uh, with all the, the sides and, and ceiling out. And... Till then, we'll see you.